Hi friends, welcome to Water Bear Reads where I discuss illustrated classics and modern classics. My name is Heather, I'm so glad you stopped by my channel, welcome. First of all, I just want to say thank you so much to all my new subscribers who subscribe during the month of April. I get such a thrill when I get a new subscriber, so thank you so much. And I also want to say thank you so much to all the people who commented on my last video, my vlog of my trip to Italy. I feel almost a creative vulnerability when I do those types of videos. And so every comment feels like 10 comments to me. So I just want to say thank you so much for that. Speaking of that vlog, I just want to say before I even get started, how much I love the Italian people. I found them to be the most welcoming, most considerate, and j just wonderful people. I mean, anything you need, you just ask them for it and they're so happy to help. I hope you guys all had a lovely April. April is my birthday month and I decided to make a cake that I've wanted to make for probably two years and every year I kind of talk myself out of it because it is kind of labor intensive. It's a vintage recipe and it's called a daffodil cake and I found this recipe on a blog called Make Fabulous Cakes and, um, and I followed it step by step and it turned out to be such a good cake and then over the weekend I served it at a little get together that I had with some friends and my mom was here and it was just delicious. There was different layers, orange creamsicle, frosting and then there was the buttercream and then there was a lemon curd most amazing recipe so i'll put that in the uh, links if in case you're interested i think it might become my annual cake i'm only going to make it once a year because <laughs> it is so good it you just can't stop eating it it's a dangerous thing to have in the refrigerator <laughs> so. so today i wanted to chat with you about all the books that we read for our trip to italy so grab yourself a warm beverage today i'm drinking a chai tea which smells amazing. Get cozy and I'll take a sip and we'll get started. So the first picture books I wanna show you are, this is Rome and this is Venice. We really love these and I in general love M. Sasek's uh, work. We have, this is Paris and we have, this is San Francisco. We went to San Francisco a couple of years ago, so I bought this. If you had watched my vlog when I was talking about the Colosseum, I said that the only disappointment was that we were expecting to see lots of cats. <laughs> and there were no cats in the Colosseum. In fact, there were no cats anywhere in Rome, now that I think of it. And I know that there's cat colonies, like huge cat colonies around Rome. I I've always heard of it, but we didn't see any cat colonies now that I think on it. I love these books, but yeah, they do sometimes have a little bit of outdated information. But they're just beautiful and I'll show you a little interior illustration. This is the Pantheon and here's Vatican City. It felt like a gentle stroll through Rome. And the same thing with Venice, with This is Venice. It was the same feeling, just like where you're just a visitor, you're being taken around. And it's so quaint and wonderful. Yeah, I really love these books by M. Sasek. So that was the first ones that we turned to when we were planning our trip. So the next book I want to show you is what we took to Pompeii, which you would have seen on the vlog. It's Escape from Pompeii by Christina Ballett. She's got the most remarkable style. She actually illustrates some books from National Geographic, Greek and Roman mythologies, Norse mythologies, and Egyptian mythologies, and her style couldn't be better suited. I'll show you a couple of pictures. This is about two kids who escape Pompeii during the eruption of 79 AD. They fled the city and they get rescued by a boat and then later on they return to, to the area and there's nothing left of the city and things have already started growing. It's a, they're old people now and it shows how there's already trees and grass and it shows that there's nothing there. Here's Mount Vesuvius. But one of the things I'm not really sure that I realized before I set out to Pompeii is how it was all underground for 1500 years, like it just didn't exist. And it kind of makes you think, 
what might have been there before Pompeii even existed, I mean, from even further back in time or with other volcanoes. One of the other things I learned from this book is they didn't know how to interpret it, but they actually did have warning of the oncoming eruption because there had been some major earthquakes, in particular a very bad earthquake that they were still repairing buildings from before the major eruption occurred, which gave me a little bit of comfort when I was staying in Pompeii because that night, the second night we were there, I must confess I had a bit of a hard time sleeping. Speaking of cats from the M. Seitzek book that I was telling you about, in another book that talked about the cats of Rome is Paolo, Emperor of Rome, written by Mac Barnett and illustrated by Claire Keane. And it is the cutest book. Here's under the dust jacket. And then both of the end papers look like this, but it's a little map of Rome, that Vatican and the Colosseum and the Roman Forum. There's the inside of the Colosseum. And when he's at the Roman Forum, Paolo is a dachshund living in a hair salon and he escapes one day when a little old lady comes to get her hair cut and she leaves the door open and he takes off and he goes around Rome and visits all these sites and he conquers the cats who are kind of trying to bully him and he joins a gang of dogs and, and he just has a wonderful time. He ends up saving some nuns from the Trevi Fountain and then he gets invited to the Vatican to stay in the Vatican in the papal chambers that are covered with art. We read this a number of times before our trip and it helped my son develop an interest in things, traveling to places like Rome and Florence and all that. Even for a kid who has interest, it can still get a bit tedious and the day can get a bit long looking at, <laughs> at sculptures and artwork. So it's really great to cultivate an interest in certain things. And that was what this book did, in particular with the Trevi Fountain, where this doggy had to save the nuns. He had to pull the nuns out of the Trevi Fountain. So that really worked well for us. Speaking of cultivating an interest in, I'd also like to recommend for that purpose as well, Renato and the Lion. This one is a library copy. It revolves around how during World War II, the caretakers of the art, how they hid some of the artwork away and how they built structures around artwork, um, such as the David or the Medici lion. And, um, and it's about a boy who, who falls in love with a Medici lion. Uh, I, showed the, I showed the lion in my video. He lays at the entrance of the loggia in the Piazza della Signoria. And this boy loves this lion. He climbs on the back, he hides on his back. And then the time comes when his father says, it's time to leave Italy. We have to move to the United States. And so the boy's really worried about this lion. So during the night, his dad hides it and he covers it with bricks in case the city of Florence gets bombed so that it stays protected. And later on, when this boy's older, he travels back and he finds the Medici lion and explains to his granddaughter how much it meant to him. And it's just a beautiful book. Here's the Piazza della Signoria. And then you kind of walk up the steps into the loggia. Here you can see the lion getting bricked up. There's an author's note at the back as well that talks about the history and what inspired her to write the book. It's just one of my favorites. We'll probably end up adding this to our bookshelves because it's just such a lovely book. Really enjoyed this. For Venice, I chose the Iva Valdi, written by Janice Scheffelman and illustrated by her late husband, Tom Scheffelman. It's in its a poignant story of Vivaldi, the composer. He almost died when he was born, and his mom let out a prayer that if he survives, she will make sure he becomes a priest. And so his mom was determined to make a priest out of him in order to keep right with her promise. But Vivaldi was musical, and he felt a strong pull towards music and compo composition and finally he came to a compromise. He did follow his mother's wishes and he studied to be a priest and at the same time kept up with his music and one day the cardinal found a solution and so Vivaldi came in charge of teaching orphan girls how to play music and he, they worked really hard and they all did really well and they became world famous and they learned to play the four seasons together and it was just wonderful to read about it in this picture book so here's the illustrations of the four seasons saint mark's square so i thought that was beautiful so 
Anyway, I just really loved this book. It was a really nice one for Venice. So there was one book that I picked up in Italy and it's actually in Italian. It's a picture book. It's by Luca Tortolini and Marco Soma and it's Chi sa che cosa sia la felicità lo dica and I think it means whoever knows what happiness is let him say so but I googled translated that title and I just love the title and <laughs> so I just went ahead and bought it and the illustrations were so pretty of all the time we were in Italy I only ducked into one proper bookstore <laughs> so I was happy to find this but it's just so pretty I love the style and there's another one I googled Marco Soma to see what other works were done by this illustrator and there's a really beautiful Italian version of the Divine Comedy that I found really cool. I'll try to link it below or put up a picture so you can see but anyway so that is my Italian picture book. I, I really like to buy at least one picture book that is in the language when I visit a country because for me it just means so much to have something that is created by artists and writers of the countries so, that I'm visiting. So that's the one I bought for Italy. Love it. All right, so that's it for the picture books. Now I'm going to show you the children's chapter books that we're reading. The first one I have for you is a classic and it holds the distinction of being the very first book that I ever spoke about on this channel when I did my first read a book by the decades video almost a year ago. It's another month or so and it will be a year since I've been on YouTube. <laughs> that book is Pinocchio. I chose to take three versions with us and you might have seen the picture on my vlog. When I read this book to my son the first time, I chose the Mina Lima version and I showed you guys on that very first video. This time we chose to read this version from the New York Review Children's Collection and it's illustrated by Fulvio Testa. It's the most cheerful version. Fulvia Testa uses watercolor pen and ink to just create the most vivid, cheerful illustrations and my son loved them. He loved rereading Pinocchio with this version. There you go. Here's the blue fairy. I particularly love this green man that is about to fry him up for dinner. <laughs> Batter him and fry him like fish. He's the green fisherman. We just had a lovely time reading this version, which I love, and I'm so happy to have another one of the New York Review Children's Collections. I've been collecting these, and I'm happy to have this one because it's one of my favorites of their collection. I was really excited to be able to read a version of Pinocchio that's illustrated by an Italian illustrator as well. The other two Pinocchios I took are my Illustrated Junior Library Edition. This one is illustrated by Fritz Crudel, who is a German illustrator who moved to New York in 1938, I think it was. But I'll just show you these real quick, which I just thought were so sweet. Go. Is one of his color illustrations. There's black and white and color throughout the book. Whenever I do my illustrator explores on my website, I um, always like to choose a paperback because I know a lot of people don't want to carry around a heavy hardback. And so I look around and see what paperbacks are out there that have really great illustration coverage. And this one is wonderful. It's the Puffin Classics and it's also very generously illustrated. This one is illustrated by Joya Fiamengi in black and white but it's all throughout the book. Let me show you a couple that are here. This is the actual Megalodon <laughs> that swallows Geppetto and Pinocchio. I know in the Disney film it's a whale but it's actually a Megalodon. I call it a Megalodon but it's a huge shark. <laughs> and then here's another one that I thought was really pretty. It's the end, at the very end when he becomes a real boy and that's the Blue Fairy. So if you're looking for a sweet paperback version, why did I take my Pinocchios to Florence, to Italy, you might ask? Well, it's because when I did my Illustrator Explore, it was my very first Illustrator Explore two years ago, I photographed all the versions of Pinocchio at the base of a tree. I really had nothing interesting to offer the photo. So now I'm updating my blog heading picture with these pictures of Pinocchio and Florence in the background and it's lovely. So I'm very excited about that. So you can check it out if you wanna see the pictures on my website. I'll put a link to it below. The next one is a real modern classic and it was kind of wonderful that we chose to read it when we did because 
I had no idea that it had anything to do with Italy whatsoever. I picked it up because so many people have been talking about it. So many friends of mine, or my cousin as well, have talked about this book and had the fond memories of re when they read this book. And the book I'm referring to is From the Mixed Up Files of Mrs. Basil E. Frankweiler, uh, written, by, written and illustrated by E. L. Konigsberg, or Elaine Lobel Konigsberg. And the reason it pertains to Italy is because there's, there's a certain mystery in here revolving around a sculpture and whether or not it was actually done by Michelangelo. These two children, Claudia and Jamie, decide to run away. It's actually Claudia who decides to run away, but she kind of involves her little brother in, in the scheme. And they run away and they decide that they're going to live at the Met Museum, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. They set up camp there and they figure out how to stay out of sight at certain times. And they set out to try and prove that this is a Michelangelo. I have this beautiful suede covered um, version with this embossed um, illustration, but I don't know if you can see it in the camera, but there's also a raised bit of three circles, which plays quite a role in it. Here's a perfect picture to show you what's on the cover. I have this other version that my son's teacher gave to him for Christmas, and so we have both versions of these. I really love these little versions, and these have the in papers that look like file cabinets. One of the things that E.O. Konigsberg said in this interview that I was watching on YouTube, I think it was an interview from back in 1983, and that is that she modeled the girl Claudia after her daughter, which I thought was really sweet when she was doing the illustrations. She also stated how she got the idea for the book because there was actually a bit of an art mystery. There was a work with it that they were trying to figure out whether or not it, it had been created by Leonardo da Vinci or his teacher, who Andrea de Baracchio. They had purchased this artwork for the very inexpensive amount of $250. Whether it was Leonardo da Vinci or Baracchio, it doesn't matter. It still would have been an amazing price. <laughs> so anyway, but they were trying to prove whether or not it really was from one of those two artists. And so that's where she got the idea from. I'll link that interview below and you can check it out if you're interested. But it was just such a wonderful book. We really had a good time reading it. By the way, this version is by Athenian, Athenian Books for Young Readers, Simon & Schuster. So anyway, it was a great choice, a great accidental choice. We read two other middle grade chapter books and it's kind of funny because they both have so much in common. The first one we're still in the middle of, it's um, The Thief Lord by Cornelia Funke. And we have Prosper and Bo, two boys who are living with their aunt and their aunt wants to separate them and she wants to keep Bo, the little one, and send off the older one. And they don't want to be separated so they run away and they decide to head to Venice and they meet up with some street kids and end up staying in an abandoned cinema. We're on chapter 38 now and I'm starting to feel like this might be a little bit of a time slip novel. Um, which is interesting because the next one I'm going to tell you about is definitely a time slip novel, so that it had that in common. And the other thing is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was referenced in this book, and so has the one I'm about to tell you about. It was written like 20 years ago, I think. There's even a movie that came out in 2006. This is one of those that my son's actually enjoying more than me, but that's okay because that's what it's written for, his age group. And they're all heading illustrations, and they are repetitive, but there's quite a few of them. Oh, and they also have these chapter endings now and then. I forgot about those, but yeah, so there's some chapter endings. Not all the chapters, but some of them have them as well. But yeah, like I said, this is one that I think my son loves more than me, but he really loves it. I always know when a book is a hit with my son because he will play make-believe and he'll start taking on the characters and pretending scenes from the book and such. So that's what tells me that this book is a real hit. The other book that has the same thing in common with The Thief Lord that also has references to The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. This was a recommendation from Elizabeth over at her channel Sips and Stories. She did a video on Middle Grade March, on really great books to read for Middle Grade March. And she recommended Da Vinci's Cat by Catherine Gilbert Murdoch. 
And Catherine Gilbert Murdoch also wrote A Book of Boy, which is a bit more famous that you might recognize, but I have not read that one yet. I really loved Da Vinci's Cat. I thought it was just fantastic, and it was such a great book for us to read at the time that we did because so much of it involves Raphael and Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel and the School of Athens. So it was very timely for us. So it's a time slip novel that centers on Federico Gonzaga, who is an actual person from history. At the time that the Sistine Chapel and the School of Athens were being painted, he was being held hostage by the Pope. And when I say held hostage, he was being kept in a villa. <laughs> and and it was sort of um, the family's reassurance that they were loyal to Rome, I believe, is what the reason for it was. But anyway, so we're focused on Federico. He's 11 years old. He's kind of a favorite with both artists, Michelangelo and Raphael. In fact, Raphael painted him in his school of Athens. I'll try and find it for you and put it up, but he's this little curly-haired boy who's, who's at the edge of the painting about where the door is where you enter the room. So Federico one day is kind of startled by the appearance of this very large box, which is in essence a wardrobe. It's a closet, they call it a closet in some points, but I think for us it would be, we would consider it a wardrobe. And this little kitten comes out of this wardrobe and Federico befriends this kitten. He has a great time with this kitten. And then the kitten walks back into the wardrobe and disappears. And then when Federico goes to look for him, he comes back out and he's a fully grown cat. And it's the same kitten. He has these Egyptian sort of linings on his eyes. And it's definitely the same cat and very recognizable. And the next day, even something even stranger happens when Herbert from modern day New Jersey <laughs> walks out. And I, as the adult, found it very interesting as well, just because it was so wrapped up in history. And like I said, it has references to The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It also has a reference to Nancy Drew. There's a lot of talk about the food <laughs> of the time period and such. So anyway, just a really good book. We really enjoyed it. I have some pages marked here. I wanted to show you the illustrations are by Paul O. Zelensky and they're, they're really just a frontispiece and chapter headings, but there's the frontispiece and I wanted to show you one of the chapter headings. I don't know if you can hear the birds outside, but they are just beautiful. They are really beautiful and having a great time out there. So that is it for my children's chapter books. Now I'm going to show you all the, all the adult books I've been reading. A couple of them are, are also illustrated. Real quick before I get started properly, I wanted to show you a book that might have been a no-brainer. You know, you're going to Italy in April, so of course you should read The Enchanted April. But the reason I didn't read it is because I had just read The Enchanted April last spring and also the previous spring. So I was just ready to find some other work that I could become acquainted with. As much as I loved The Enchanted April by Elizabeth von Arnhem, by the way, my library actually has a copy, a folio copy of this version. And I love this version. It's the one that I read both times, illustrated by Deborah McFarlane, who I follow on Instagram. And I love her work. She's got the most beautiful artwork. She does some other Folio Society editions, the, the Little White Horse, which I also own in my collection, but also the Pink Fairy book, which I wish that I owned. <laughs> and then there's some more that I'm forgetting at the moment. Peter Pan, it's so beautiful. And I want to buy it for myself with the slipcase. There's an illustration from by Deborah McFarlane. I just wanted to mention this book because I know a lot of people are probably thinking, she went to Italy in April. She should read The Enchanted April. <laughs> but it's because I had already read it a couple of times already. So I just had decided to do something different this time. The other book that I want to tell you about before I really get into is The Merchant of Venice. I'm still in the middle of this in a way, but I've decided to put it on hold and read an adapted version, a children's adapted version. <laughs> I'm kind of lost. In The Merchant of Venice, I really don't know much about the plot or anything about it. So it's brand new to me. So I just thought, you know what, I'm going to put on hold. I'm going to find out what the story's about, then come back to it and read it with the understanding already. I wanted to show you these beautiful illustrations. And it's illustrated by Henry Courtney Sellis. And he has the most expressive 
black and white drawings. I really love them. So I will update you on The Merchant of Venice once I go through that route, read it, the adapted version, and then come back and read this again. <laughs> then maybe by my spring wrap-up video, I'll have it done. Here's the bookmark I bought in Venice. A water, beautiful watercolor. And by the way, I really love this publishing company called Sea Wolf Press. So many times when I'm trying to find an illustrated version of something, and it proves to be either very difficult to find or very expensive. I turn to Seawolf Press. They're very well priced and I find them rather attractive. I think they're quite good with how they present their cover, their artwork and such. Daisy Miller by Henry James and I have here again the Seawolf Press edition which I think is really pretty with the daisies on the cover. This one is illustrated by Henry McVicker and Henry McVicker was, besides being an illustrator, he was also pretty ensconced in the upper class society of New York during the Gilded Age. And um, he was um, a real estate investor, I believe, besides being an artist. Here is a place in Switzerland that they traveled to at one point called the Chateau de Chillon. And um, so there's that. And then I thought this was beautiful with a piece of the Roman Forum, the Roman remains in the background. There's all kind of decorative elements as well, like this one. But that as that wasn't actually the page I wanted to show you. The page I wanted to show you was this one. It's the Colosseum with a bat with a death. I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. But in Daisy Miller, we have Daisy who is on vacation with her mom and her brother, her little brother Randolph, and they're in Switzerland, in Vevey, Switzerland. Randolph, her little brother, meets M Mr. Winterborn and starts a conversation with him and introduces him to his sister Daisy. Now, Daisy is an American and Mr. Winterborn is also an American. They're both from upper class society, but they're different. And then Daisy, she is also refined, but she's just not concerned with the societal rules or pressures that perhaps she should have been. And Mr. Winterborn is rather charmed by her. He's a bit suspicious of her. He's not sure what he thinks of her, but, at, but overall, he's very charmed by her. And he invites her along to go visit the Chateau de Chillon, which I showed you an illustration of in here just now. And then Daisy and her family travel to Rome, and Mr. Winterborn follows a bit later. I thought it was really interesting. I thought it was very well written. I thought the descriptions of places were amazing because Henry James describes them so beautifully but also very succinctly in like one or two lines and really creates a vibe or a feeling of, of place in a very, very short amount of words, which I just thought was wonderful. The one thing that I was struggling with though is that I would have liked to have known more about Daisy Miller's background. and. Also her mother, because her mother was also a very confusing character. She just sort of existed. She didn't really have any problems with her daughter and or how she was behaving or any advice for her daughter. She was just sort of there. Daisy had a very free hand and I would have liked to have understand why they were like that, like why they had that relationship, why Daisy behaved the way she did, because a lot of the ways that she behaved, they just felt like they occurred without any sort of reason behind it. I just would have liked to have seen more character development in that sense, and I think I would have understood Daisy Miller better. I loved how it touched on events in history that I didn't know about. Like, for one thing, that malaria was prevalent in Rome throughout several times in history and throughout the time in which this novel is set. It, it was so prevalent that walking outside af at dusk or after dark was actually a rather risky activity. And it seemed to be very prevalent in the areas around the Colosseum and the Roman ruins for some reason, especially. So that was very interesting. It was first published in 1878 in a magazine called Cornhill Magazine. And, um, and then the following year they put it in book format and it started Henry James' literary career basically. And I think what really reverberated with me was the theme of the of innocence versus experience that you see throughout the book. It's funny, I enjoyed this. I really enjoyed it. It got me thinking. And I, I would really like to read more Henry James. 
after this. Speaking of Henry James, I know I said in a previous video that I was going to read Italian Hours, and I booked it from the library, brought it home, but when I started reading it, I just couldn't get into it, so I just decided to choose Daisy Miller. A Room with a View, where Daisy Miller rushed into re relationships without fear, without worry. Lucy from A Room with a View fought against it. She found herself in love with somebody who was not from her social group and she fought against it because she was worried about how it would be accepted, about how she would be perceived. Lucy and her aunt Charlotte are in Florence and they're staying at, the ho at a hotel, Hotel Bertolini I think the name of it is. They find themselves arriving, going to the rooms and discover that there is no view and they had been expecting a view and later they go to dinner and at dinner they're talking about it and they're overheard by Mr. Emerson and, his, and Mr. Emerson is traveling with his son George and Mr. Emerson kindly offers them to exchange rooms. He says he has a beautiful view from his room his, and his son has a beautiful view from his room and why don't they, why don't they just change rooms? And he reasons that gentlemen don't care about views and ladies do care about views so you, it makes sense that we should give you the view, you know. And, and um, so um, Charlotte, um, Lucy's aunt, rejects the offer because she's worried that if they were to take the offer that they would be beholden to Mr. Emerson and George who are beneath them in society. A little bit later Charlotte's chatting about Mr. Emerson and inquiring about his character and they're told he's, he's of the most upstanding character. They have no worries on that score and so on their behalf the rooms are negotiated and they end up with rooms with a view. But it becomes so much more because Lucy while exploring Florence runs into Mr. Emerson and his son George and gets to know them a little. They also run into each other in the Piazza della Signoria um, and George actually assists her. There's an event that happens there. And then they go on a picnic out into the hills that overlook Florence and there's this beautiful scene described as poppy fields and there's this very romantic scene that happens there. And Lucy finds herself falling in love with George but not able to reconcile committing herself to someone who's in a different social group than her. She even engages herself to another man who is rather dull, really not right for her, but he's in the same social standing. And it's about her having the courage to follow her heart. It's different from Daisy Miller in the fact that Daisy Miller is a, is a tragic story. A Room with a View has a very happy ending. I think this is going to be one of my favorite books of the year. I found this version and I bought it because I just thought it was so pretty. But for the life of me, I can't figure out who the artist is. It's not written anywhere. It's printed by Digo Books, by the way. I just thought the, the cover illustration was beautiful. I highly recommend this book. I will chat about it some more. And um, yeah, A Room with a View. The Virago Modern Classics edition of Roman Fever by Edith Wharton. And I have to tell you, I'm not much of a short story reader. I will give Edith Wharton short stories its due because this Roman Fever was so good. It just really packed a punch. And when I was done, I, I read it in the early morning hours and when I was making breakfast and getting my son off to school, I was just grinning <laughs> because it was such a good story, a story well told. It is about um, two women in their middle ages, both mothers, both with girls of the same age. They're in Rome, they're at a restaurant overlooking the Roman Forum and they're reminiscing and chatting about life and about their history. They've been friends since their youth. It's fantastic. I was really trying to focus on stories that were absolutely set in Italy, where things were occurring in Italy. And again, it's referencing the malaria that was present in Rome, where I expressed before where it was dangerous to go outside after a certain time of the day. But yeah, so very good, very much enjoyed this one. And the final book I have to show you, I'm in the middle of reading, and it is called My Italian Bulldozer by Alexander McCall Smith. My mom saw saw that I had been looking at it and then she snuck it in and bought it for me and I decided to go ahead and read it. Really, really love it. It's just great. We have a writer and he's just been left by his girlfriend. She left him for the personal trainer <laughs> and his editor 
suggests that he goes to Italy and so that he can finish working and he goes off to Italy. There's a bit of a kerfuffle at the rental car place um, and he finds himself without any cars to rent, but there is a bulldozer he can rent. So he's at first very skeptical about this bulldozer. He eventually rents it and he drives around the Italian countryside with this bulldozer and going from place to place. And it's, it's wonderful. It's about the food that they eat. It's, there's historical references. There's reference to famous works of literature, to art. And the people that he meets are such perfect examples of Italians, of the people that I talked about at the beginning of this video. <laughs> I actually want to cry because they're just the most beautiful people. So I will tell you more about this when I do my my spring reading wrap ups, but very, very much enjoying this book. Have you read this book? Let me know in the comments if you have. Well, that is it. Those are the books that we read for our trip to Italy. I hope you enjoyed this video. I actually have a pile of books that I put together when we went to travel to Spain last year, and I would love to share them with you. I wasn't on YouTube yet at that stage, so I'll have to find some way to fit in a video about the books we read when we were traveling to Spain. Before I go, I just want to say a very special thank you to some fellow booktubers who mentioned me over the month of April. Amy over at Amy of Hearth Ridge, and Jen from Jen's Reading Life, and Anne over at In Search of Wonder. I just want to say thank you so much. It makes me feel like part of the community when I get a mention. Thank you so much for sticking around to the end of this video. Thank you for watching it and I will see you in the next video. Bye.